This video is an introduction to finite fields. We start by focusing on one of the reasons as to why we require finite fields in cryptography. Based on the motivation, we built up the definition for a finite field. We dwell a bit on the fact that finite fields do not require us to use numbers to then return to using numbers because they do make life a lot easier. Finally, I will leave you with some pointers for what to study next or who knows some possible topics for future videos. There are two main reasons behind the frequent use of finite fields in cryptography. The first one being that finite fields have certain mathematical properties that you can exploit to create cryptographic building blocks, which we then in turn use to build secure protocols. This is the more typical reason to see finite fields pop up in your cryptography textbooks. The other reason is much more practical. Finite fields enable us to implement cryptographic theories in the real world. Because this reason is a simple practical need, it is also a much more convenient way to introduce finite fields without the need for a strong mathematical background. So that is what I chose as the focus for this video. In previous videos I have talked a lot about the Shamir secret sharing scheme and secure multi-party computation. Of course you should watch these videos if you have not done so already, but for the sake of understanding finite fields we just need to recap the following simple but important observation. Which is that if I give you one point in the graph, there is an infinite number of straight lines that pass through this point. Each of these lines has a different value when passing through the y-axis. However, if I give you two points in the graph, there is only exactly one straight line that passes through both points. And it also passes through one single point on the y-axis. We can now use this to share a secret value. Suppose that I have a safe with a keypad lock and the secret code to open the safe is 0004 or just the number 4. I pick a random straight line to draw through the number 4 on the y-axis. For example, f of x is 4 minus x and I keep this formula to myself. I now tell to my two friends who by sheer coincidence are named Alice and Bob, each one point on the line. Alice learns that f of 1 is 3 and Bob learns that f of 2 is 2. If Bob only knows his own point on the line or his share of the secret, as it is called, every code to the safe is equally likely because there is always a straight line that passes through the value on the y-axis and Bob's point. This is a very desirable property which we call perfect secrecy. Bob does not learn anything about the possible value of the secret. Only when Alice and Bob combine their shares, they can use basic high school math to reconstruct the line and with it find the code for the safe. They can then open the safe and find the treasure inside, a sheet of paper that says that sharing was the real treasure all along. They will not like it. Watch my other videos to find out how this scheme can be extended to work with any number of shares while preserving perfect secrecy until the desired threshold number of shares are combined. So, in theory, we have a perfect method to share the secret code for the safe. Now, let's get practical and implement this in some simple Python code. Internet law requires me to remind you that you should not really try to implement your own crypto libraries. Let's go ahead and try it anyway. For this example, we say that the secret value that we want to share is a value 1. And as the function for the line, we choose f of x is 1 plus 1 third times x. We now give Alice the secret share f of 3 and Bob the secret share f of 1. We can see that, as expected, Alice has received the value 1 plus 1 third times 3, or 2, while Bob has received 1 plus 1 third times 1, which is 1.33333333. Now, while very close to the correct value, 1 and 1 third, this is not exactly the same. If Bob and Alice were to combine their shares to reconstruct the line, they would get a value very close to, but not exactly, the initial secret 1. Perhaps this is just the Python interpreter not wanting to print out an infinite stream of trees. So let's force it to print the first 60 decimals of Bob's secret value. This actually looks even worse. After 15 trees, we seem to get random digits until eventually the program has given up and just shows zeros. This is an interesting consequence of how computers tend to represent numbers. You probably already know that computers typically reserve a number of bytes to store a value. 
And while this works quite naturally for whole integer values like 7 or 208, it becomes a bit more challenging if not impossible to encode the infinite amount of decimal values between say 1 and 2. The most common solution is to use something called a floating point number, which stores an approximation of the value which leads to inaccuracies such as the one we see here. If you want to learn more about floating point representation, I am posting a link in the description of this video. There are alternative ways in which we could represent non-integer values in a computer that would not result in such approximations of fractions. This is typically called a symbolic representation or symbolic mathematics. However, working with such representations is complex and does not match the performance of a much more binary-friendly representation. The alternative solution offered by finite fields that we are going to discuss today is both much cleaner and does not suffer from the same drop in performance. So knowing that using fractions and non-integer values is problematic in practice, we could simply say that we do not allow such values to be used in our scheme. We update our program and change the secret formula to be f of x is 1 plus x. Again, we give f of 3 to Alice and f of 1 to Bob. So Alice learns that f of 3 is 4 and Bob learns that f of 1 is 2. Now we only have nice integer values that can be conveniently stored in a computer's memory. However, we have created a different problem. You see, although neither Alice nor Bob learns the exact value of the secret based on their own share, they can learn what the value of the secret is not. For example, Alice learns that the secret cannot be 2, because in that case for f of 3 to be 4, the function should have read f of x is 2 plus 2 thirds times x. And we know that the program does not accept non-integer values. In other words, our property of perfect secrecy is lost. So we arrive at the following problem. Computers must limit the possible values in our domain since they need to be represented in a limited amount of bytes. In that context, the best we can hope for as perfect secrecy is that each of those values in the limited set remains equally likely to be the secret until enough shares are combined. However, as our example just showed, this is not easily achieved. So, perfect secrecy in practice. Is such a thing even possible? Yes, it is. From now on, I will be talking a lot about numbers, but not exactly in the way that you probably think about numbers. So far, we have been using so-called real numbers in our secret sharing scheme. That is, we assume the existence of numbers like 2 thirds, pi, etc. But let's have a closer look at operations that we perform on those numbers when we share and retrieve a secret to identify what properties of numbers we actually use. When we create the function to share the secret, it is of the form f of x is a plus b times x. When we combine two shares, f of x1 is y1 and f of x2 is y2, we retrieve the function and the secret value a, we use the following steps. The slope of the line, b, can be found by computing y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. And once we have b, we can compute a as y1 minus b times x1. I hope you still remember this from high school. And don't worry, the math does not really get much more complicated than this, since these are all the steps involved in this scheme. Now, it is important to realize that we never care about the actual values of the numbers. We do not really care what the value of, say, Alice's share is, whether it's larger or smaller than the value of Bob's share, or whether it is odd or even. The only thing that we do use are the relations between numbers. That is, we care about the properties of the operations addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. For example, if we were to write out the full, detailed mathematical proof that this scheme works, we would use the fact that adding and removing the same value returns in the same original value. Before we start looking more closely into what it is that we really need from these operations, we will first reduce the number of operations. Because we are going to give a very specific description of these operations, this is going to save us quite some time. First, we get rid of subtraction by observing that a minus b is the same as a plus negative b. We call negative b the additive inverse of b. 
Similarly, get rid of the vision by having a multiplicative inverse. So dividing a by b is the same as multiplying a by b to the power minus 1. In practice, for real numbers, b raised to the power of minus 1 will be 1 divided by b. We rewrite our formulas from before to use only addition and multiplication, and are now ready to fully specify exactly what properties of numbers and operations we need to get the scheme to work. Now, I must warn you that the next bit is going to be a bit dull. Unfortunately, there is little we can do to make it fun, so let's just make it quick instead. What we need for sure are the numbers themselves, the binary operations of addition and multiplication, and the notation for these inverse values. What we need next are the following properties. We start by introducing two convenient properties. First, we want addition and multiplication to be commutative. That is, it should not matter whether you add a to b or b to a, the resulting number should be the same. Second, we want both operations to be associative. It should not matter whether you first multiply a and b and then multiply by c, or whether you first multiply b and c and then multiply by a. Next, we require that there be a so-called identity element for each binary operation. We will need this in order to define the inverse elements. We require that there are two distinct numbers, 0 and 1. For any number, if you add 0, you get the same number back. And for any number, if you multiply by 1, you get also the same number back. We can then define what we require of the inverse values. For addition, for every number a, there exists an additive inverse value, negative a, so that if you add these elements together, you get the identity element of the addition operation, which is 0. Similarly, for multiplication, for every number a, there exists a multiplicative inverse, value a to the power of minus 1, so that if you multiply these elements together, you get the identity element of the multiplication operation, which is 1. As you already know, there is one exception here, namely that we do not require that there exists an inverse element for multiplication for the identity element of addition. That is a very complicated way of saying that there does not have to be a number which you could multiply by 0 and get 1. Effectively, it is the same as saying that division by zero is undefined. Finally, there is the somewhat more technical property of distributivity, which explains how the addition and multiplication operation combine. We will not go further into that. While a bit boring, these properties are all that is needed to formally prove that our secret sharing scheme from before is both correct, that is, if you have two shares of the secret, you can uniquely determine the original secret value, and provide perfect secrecy. That is, if you only have one share of the secret, all values of the secret are equally likely. The same properties are also sufficient if we want to break up the scheme into three or more shares. I won't go into detail in this video, but if you want to see the proofs, you can pause now to see the proof for perfect secrecy, and now for correctness, for which you also need a few helping lemmas. This collection of properties is what is called a field, and if the set of numbers is limited, it's called a finite field. We already have an easy example of an infinite field, the real numbers with regular addition and multiplication as we know them. Before giving an example of a finite field that has a finite set of numbers that satisfy all these required properties, let's take a closer look at other properties of regular numbers that we do not require and therefore do not need in order to create our secret sharing scheme. Most importantly, like I mentioned before, we do not care about the value of a number. For example, we do not care that an infinite number of values exist between 2.1 and 2.2. We do not even care that some numbers are larger than others. We do not need value-based properties like being odd or even, or that 2 plus 2 gives the same value as 2 times 2. All that we care about is how the numbers relate to each other with addition and multiplication. So because the numbers themselves do not matter, textbook definitions of fields typically say that a field consists of elements rather than numbers. So on our previous definition, we can replace the word numbers with elements and still have a field and our secret sharing algorithm. Now, in practice, you will find that we do use numbers to create fields, but we can use other entities instead if we want to. For example, in cryptography, irreducible polynomials are often used as the elements of a field. But the elements do not even have to be something that looks like math at all. 
we could create a finite field with a bunch of little cute monsters if we wanted to. So let's do that! On a faraway island there live three kinds of colorful creatures. Let's call them ghosts, aliens and goblins. These creatures do not always get along, sometimes they will eat each other. And when one creature has eaten another, as a result of the added weight, it might transform into a different creature. Other times the creatures do get along. They can get along very well even. And when they get intimate and multiply, again their love might yield in a different offspring creature. A few years ago researchers visited the island for several months and discovered that the type of a new creature was not random but fully determined by what two creatures ate each other or what two creatures mated. They were even able to draw the following chart showing how the creatures merge. As it turned out, the creatures, together with their eating and mating behavior, form a finite field. Let's have a look together. First of all, the eating and mating relations are commutative. It does not matter whether a goblin eats an alien or an alien eats a goblin, the resulting creature will always be an alien. And naturally the same is true for the mating relation. Second, both relations are associative. If we had three angry creatures, one goblin, one alien and one ghost, it could be that first the goblin and the alien would eat each other to form one alien and then the alien and the ghost would eat each other to form one goblin. But it could also be that first the alien and the ghost would eat each other to form one goblin and then the two goblins would eat each other to become a single goblin. So regardless of the eating order, we would always end up with a single goblin which means that the relationship is associative. And the same is true for the mating relation. Next, we take a closer look at goblins. No matter what other creature a goblin eats or gets eaten by, the result will always be that other creature. Somewhat similarly, there are the aliens. No matter what other creature it mates with, the result will always be the other creature. So they are the identity elements on this island. It would seem that this is an evolutionary disadvantage to the goblins and alien species. However, nature balances things out. Because for every creature there exists another creature, so that when they eat each other the result is a goblin, or the identity element for eating. Similarly, for every creature except for the goblin, there is another creature so that if they mate, the result is an alien or the identity element for mating. Finally, the creatures even follow the distributivity between the eating and mating relations. The researchers that visited the island concluded that it had truly been a great field trip. Get it? Field trip? <coughs> What this example hopefully makes clear is that while the eating and mating behave like addition and multiplication, the creatures are not at all numbers like we know them, but they still form a finite field. And because they form a finite field, we could abuse these poor creatures to implement Shamir's secret sharing scheme. We're going to fall a bit of the wagon here though, driving the analogy through all the way to the end, but we're committed to it now. On the island there is a dark forest. And through the dark forest goes a long and windy path. If you send the creature down this path, it will always first come across one unknown but always the same creature B and mate with this creature. Next, the offspring of this mating will continue down the path only to get eaten by another and always the same creature A. You do not get to see what happens on the path, but you do see the creature that comes out at the other end of the forest. Now I will leave proving this as an exercise. Let's say that Alice sends an alien down the path in the forest and after a while sees a goblin come out at the other end. Similarly, Bob sends a ghost down the path and out comes another ghost. If you would take the time you should be able to find that for both Alice and Bob each creature is equally likely to be creature A in the forest if they only have their own information available. However, if they combine their information, they can figure out exactly which creatures are located at spots A and B. Okay, so this was all a bit crazy, but I think it is important to understand that this is as equally valid a finite field as any other finite field you will see in the future, and that no numbers were used. Also, no creatures were harmed in the creation of this finite field. Unfortunately, this toy field does not scale very well if we would like to have more elements. 
for starters, I would have to find cute pictures for every new creature that we want to add. And what is worse, we would have to update the eating and mating relationship so that they keep preserving the field properties. The number of elements that make up a finite field is also known as the field order. So on our island, the field order is 3. If our secret represented something that can be guessed in some brute force manner, for example, it represents the access code to a safe, it means that someone only has to make 3 tries to access the safe anyway. If our safe has a 4 digit access code, we need to have a finite field of at least order 10,000 to make sure that releasing the shared secrets does not reduce the amount of brute force guesswork needed to open the safe. Ideally, there would be a way to generate a finite field of more or less a desired order. That way, we can create a field of the right size that fits both our security requirements as well as, for example, our computing infrastructure. For example, the elements must fit within 1632 or 64 bits. The easiest solution is to go back to the numbers and use them to create a finite field. After all, normal, real numbers already form an infinite field, so they might be a good starting point to create a finite one. If we start with the real numbers, we are going to have too many elements in our field, infinitely too many. Let's make a first simplification and remove all non-integer values, that is all non-whole numbers. This still leaves an infinite amount of values, but they are a bit more comprehensible. Next we drop all the negative values. Now we are left with just half an infinite set of values, which is in practice just as infinite. Finally, let's pick a random number, say 100, and remove all values equal to or higher than this number. Collection of 100 numbers that are left is what is called the group of integers modulo 100. This is also written as set 100. By the way, Z here supposedly comes from the German word Zahlen, meaning numbers. It was introduced in an article written by Nicolas Bourbaki, which is actually a pseudonym for a group of mathematicians who, surprisingly, mostly speak French. Etymology in mathematics can be confusing. If you are interested in these things, look into the etymology of the word field on the page linked in the video description. But back to our group, it is obvious that this collection of elements is finite and we need to slightly change the addition and multiplication operation so that the results of this operation stay within the collection of numbers. We can do this by taking all results of operations modulo 100. You might have seen the modulo operation before. In simple terms it means that we will add or subtract 100 from the result until we get a value that is between 0 inclusive and 100 exclusive. For example, 20 modulo 7 is 6, minus 3 modulo 8 is 5, and 82 modulo 101 is 82. So, in the group of integers modulo 100, 4 times 30 is 120, but becomes 20. And 82 plus 35 is 117, but becomes 17. One additional interesting aspect of modular arithmetic is how we can compute very high exponents. For example, 97 to the power 98 would, in regular arithmetic, produce a very long number that cannot even be understood by a computer without resorting to a non-standard number encoding. However, in modular arithmetic, we can reduce the size of these numbers thanks to pairwise multiplication. At first, we note that 97 to the power 98 is the same as 97 to the power of 2 times 49. We can first compute the 97 to the power 2 part and then make the realization that the result, 9409, does not exist within our set of numbers. Instead, this is the value 9409 modulo 100, that is, simply 9. We can keep doing this and at no point in our computation get a value higher than 10,000. The final result of this computation, 89, is exactly the same value as we would get from taking that very long digit on the top and taking that value modulo 100. Now this is all very cool and all, but the question remains whether these 100 elements form a field. First, we need to define addition and multiplication so that the results remain within the set of 100 elements. As we discussed, we can do this by simply taking the normal operations and then using the result modulo 100. We then need to check that the field properties still hold. For most of the properties, this seems straightforward. 15 plus 60 is the same as 60 plus 15, and 20 times 18 is still the same as 18 times 20, so we are still commutative. 
associativity, 0 and 1 as identity elements, and distributivity are also easily shown to hold. The only challenging properties are the existence of inverse elements for every element. For addition, we can define the inverse element of a value a quite simply as 100 minus a. For example, minus 5 becomes 95 and minus 28 becomes 72. That way, when we add an element in its inverse, we get 100, which modulo 100 is 0. For the inverse element of multiplication, that is finding a value such that when multiplied we get 1, the story is different. Before, the inverse element of 3 was 1 third, but 1 third is no longer an element of our field. However, after some searching, we find out that 67 is in fact an inverse element for 3, because 3 times 67 is 201, which modulo 100 is equal to 1. Unfortunately, as opposed to the addition operation, it is not easy to argue that an inverse element exists for all values other than 3 as well. In fact, in this case it is impossible because there are values, such as 5, which do not have a multiplicative inverse. That means we cannot define a multiplicative inverse for all values, which means that Z100 is not a finite field. We are, however, very close. As it turns out, if instead of 100 we would have taken a prime number, any prime number, we would have created a finite field. For example, Z101, with the modifications of always taking addition and multiplication operations modulo 101, is a finite field because there is always a multiplicative inverse. Proof that this is the case is a bit involved and requires either the use of something called the extended Euclidean algorithm or Fermat's little theorem. It is something that we won't cover in this video, but it is a proof that is worth looking into because both approaches will also tell you how to efficiently compute the multiplicative inverse of an element in the field. In the video description, I am leaving a link to an exercise PDF from Stanford University which discusses this proof. So, we now finally have what we were looking for, a recipe to create a finite field of a minimal desired size. We just choose one prime value n that is larger than the desired size and define the operations as we discussed. To get a multiplicative inverse, you can use either of the proof methods. I should mention that this is just a and not the recipe for creating finite fields. More general ways exist and they are also a bit more flexible in the order of finite field not having to be exactly a prime number. But this video has been going on for quite some time now, so let's bring it back to the start and finally implement Shamir's secret sharing scheme for our save. To share the 4 digit code of a save, we would find a prime number larger than 10,000, for example 10,007, and implement this scheme with a group of integers modulo 10,007. Properties of the finite field guarantee that if you do not combine enough shares, all 10,007 values within the field are equally likely to be the code to the save. Except of course the values 10,000 and higher, but any attacker already knew this information beforehand, so nothing new is learned from the secret shares. Now, I have spent a lot of time in this video attempting to explain the concept of a finite field in a way that I hope will stick. However, it has taken a lot of time and I think that even the two viewers that got to this point in the video must be growing tired. So let's finish up at this point and let me make a few final remarks. First, if you are a student of cryptography, the next step for you would be to look into the proof that any group of integers modulo prime number is indeed a finite field. And if not the proof, at least you will want to know how to compute the multiplicative inverse for a given number in a field. It will also be the logical next video for me to create, but if you are familiar with my release schedule, you probably want to look it up yourself. Luckily, this computation is typically thought in any cryptography course. Next, while we have been talking only about fields, we can now quickly introduce a number of other common terms. A ring is like a field, but fewer requirements on the multiplication operation. In particular, it does not require commutativity or the existence of an identity element and inverse operation. An abelian group is like a field, except without requiring the multiplication operation and the properties associated with it at all. And a group is like an abelian group, except without requiring commutativity on the addition operation. You may notice that there is a relation between these terms. Every field is a ring, every ring is an abelian group, and every abelian group is a group. 
There are a whole lot more types of rings and groups, each having a slightly different set of requirements on the addition and multiplication operations. You can find many of them on Wikipedia. A minimal grasp would be that groups only have one operation, whereas rings and fields have two. As a reward for understanding this, you can search for the love song Finite Simple Group of Order 2 on YouTube and understand why the audience is laughing. Or at least you can understand one or two more laughs than before. Finally, this video builds its story motivating the use of finite fields in cryptography, showing that it's a clean way to give a practical implementation of a mathematical theory, so that you can run stuff on a computer without worrying about floating points or accidentally revealing secret information. However, as mentioned at the very beginning of this video, there is another, at least equally important reason for using finite fields. Exactly because finite fields do not behave like regular numbers, it becomes computationally very hard to compute certain operations. The standard example is the so-called discrete log problem found in finite groups and therefore in finite fields. The problem is to determine the value of x in a to the power x is b given the values a and b. Even your pocket calculator can do this quickly for regular real numbers or infinite fields, but nobody knows of a way to do this quickly for all finite groups or fields. In particular, several public key cryptographic schemes base their security on the assumption that there is no efficient solution. If you read papers on cryptography, you will therefore typically read phrases like This shows that the algorithm is secure under the discrete log assumption. Some of these problems, including the discrete log problem, do have an efficient algorithm to solve the equation that can only be run on a quantum computer. That, however, is a topic for a very different video. And so, it is time for me to go into hibernation again. Thank you very much for watching all the way to the end, and I see you next time.